Now, what I wanted to do, they've asked me to give an impossible talk. And uh, so we're going to uh, start it anyway and uh, see about the history of chemical sensitivity. And of course, um, this is an adverse reaction to the ambient dose of toxic chemicals. And uh, it started with Hippocrates. And uh, maybe before that in Chinese medicine, but we don't know that because our Chinese is not very good in America. <clears throat> but some people, Hippocrates realized that some people could eat cheese and uh, others couldn't, and it would make them sick. And then uh, the next thing he found was that uh, uh, if a person fasted for uh, three to four days and then ate certain substances, they would become ill. Now we've seen that principle over and over again, and if you look in Gray's Anatomy in Guyton's Physiology, which uh, is a surgeon's Bible, uh, we saw this. Now Al Corwin and John Hopkins showed the nutritional aspect of chemical sensitivity along with Linus Pauling and uh, Jeff Bland. Hans Selye uh, recorded the uh, uh, general adaptation syndrome, <clears throat> and that certainly is part of what uh, David was talking about and that I'm going to be uh, talking about because people get used to substances and the problem with getting used to a substance is that after a while you don't realize what's causing it and therefore you have to build uh, structures and and uh, do diets and do safe water so that you can prove cause and effect. Uh, being a surgeon I come at this as a different point of view a little bit and I always have to have cause and effect or I'll lose my license. And so if uh, somebody gets stabbed or somebody gets shot or they're in an auto accident or they have arterial sclerosis, you've got to approve cause and effect before you can uh, help these people. Now, uh, Francis Hare in Australia wrote a book on the food factors and disease. And uh, then Albert Rowe in 1931 uh, also uh, wrote uh, a book on this, and I urge you all to read those because they're all quite uh, informative. And a, wr a wrinkle in 31 or 36 did uh, showed the masking or the adaptation of different substances that they were repeatedly exposed to. And if you think about modern medicine, we're always taught that you got to get used to something if you're going to take a medication or you're going to uh, they do a diet and you do it every day. Well, I would submit that maybe this is not true, that maybe you need to avoid things and prove cause and effect. Um, the next thing is, is that uh, uh, Wrinkle described cyclic food allergy and then uh, Randolph uh, described the triggering of chemicals in the f foods for the adaptation syndrome and he was the guy that really described modern uh, chemical sensitivity. And uh, he uh, wrote his book, uh, Human Ecology and Susceptibility to the Chemical Environment. Uh, first printing was in 62. Uh, Jim Willoughby of Kansas City uh, showed that uh, uh, sometimes to treat foods and to treat mold sensitivity, you had to do serial dilution injections of the substance to not only uh, cause masking if you needed to, but really to eliminate cause if you couldn't eliminate the substance. And this is part of our problem, I think, in modern medicine, that sometimes we can't eliminate the cause, but we can neutralize it. And if we can neutralize it uh, with nutrients or with injection therapy, then we can pr not only prove cause and effect, but get these people well. And uh, John McLennan in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, confirmed this for chemicals. Now, the first environmental unit uh, was by another surgeon, Larry Dickey, in uh, Colorado, Fort Collins. And uh, he wrote the first uh, book on uh, uh, clinical ecology in 1976. Carlton Lee was the individual also from uh, the Midwest who showed the provocation neutralization uh, could be done by intradermal means or oral means, proving cause and effect. And Joe Miller wrote a book uh, in 76 uh, confirming this. 
Now, there are, there are six, seven principles that one needs to use to prove co uh, uh, cause and effect. And I'm going to go into those uh, because of the fact that if we don't use these principles, the principles will not, uh, the facts will not turn out as we like. And of course, the, the first principle is the surgeon's principle. It's the principle of total body load. You, don't, you, you can't clean uh, wounds and heal wounds if you don't clean them. And uh, if they're dirty, uh, you've got to wash them out and clean them and debride them so that uh, the wounds will heal. Well, we look at this the same in environmental and electrical sensitivity uh, as wood. And these are a few of the uh, uh, angles that you'll see uh, that make up the total body load. Obviously, the total body load is the environment. It's legion. And of course, in my opinion, uh, it overwhelms genetics uh, totally. The genetics may be how we respond to something, but the environment can overcome the genetics, and any dirty wound can cause, cause and effect. So we look at the patient and their environment as a total body and a total environmental load. Now in this, therefore, we have to uh, do some uh, manipulation of the environment to get people well and to prove cause and effect. So the second principle is the principle that we saw with Cellier and other people were adaptation, getting used to the phenomena. We like to get a people in a controlled environment, less polluted environment, de-adapt the patient so we can prove cause and effect. I'm sort of a nut being a surgeon on proving cause and effect because you can't treat a wound if you don't prove cause and effect. And then the third one, as uh, uh, David said, is we're not all the same. I look out over this audience and I don't see anybody that looks exactly like the other person. So therefore, biochemical individuality means that we have to tailor the treatment and the diagnosis for the individual. We have to prove cause and effect to get a proper response. Finally, there's a little talk phenomena that we have observed over and over again, and that's the phenomena of switch. That a person may uh, have uh, a runny nose and then all of a sudden get an arrhythmia, or a person may have GI upset, bloating, and so on, and uh, then they get arthritis. And we don't seem to be able to see that the two are related and could be caused by the same chemical or same electromagnetics, uh, but at a different uh, frequency or a different amount. So that, that's the, uh, another principle. And then the other principle, you say, is the spreading phenomena. And what happens uh, in a bacterial or viral situation if it goes wild? It keeps going from organ to organ to organ, doesn't it? You get a sore throat, you may get sinus, you may get then uh, bronchitis or asthma, and you may get pulmonary failure. We've seen this over and over again in our patients. So that's the spreading. This can happen with uh, nerve uh, exposure, vascular exposure, and uh, any organ that you want. And, and finally, then there's the law of nerve injury, which we all seem to ignore a little bit also. And that law is, is if uh, you got a blow to a nerve and you got a paralyzed nerve or you got a very hypersensitive nerve, uh, it finally heals if you can take the cause away from it. However, it, it may remain vulnerable. And so therefore, the next hit is, uh, uh, brings it out again. For example, we have seen tons of kids uh, and, and also adults in America who had a, a head injury as a kid. They got knocked out or they were playing football and they got whacked uh, real bad. And then later on in life, they got hit with a certain chemical, say formaldehyde or phenol, or the most common in America is a herbicide, pesticide, and or natural gas exposure of these things. And uh, then all of a sudden, that wound comes back again and uh, the person gets a neuropathy or a neurovascular phenomena. And as I will show 
uh, tomorrow some of the vascular diseases we see that we've been able to trace using a controlled environment for this, okay? Now, I, uh, my group, uh, being a cardiac surgeon, I grew up where you had to have technology, the patient didn't live. Now that happens still today, but the technology is much more uh, um, perfected. And I thought to myself, well, what we know about electrical and chemical sensitivity is zilch, except we've shocked thousands of patients back to life, and so we do run on electricity, so we know that that uh, happens, you see. And I thought, well, why don't we start bringing some technology and get the smart people in, like some of these scientists around here. Uh, being a dumb surgeon, I had to have help on uh, getting people going. So uh, what we did is use materials of oxygenation and nutrition uh, from the cardiovascular surgery at the University of Texas at Southwestern and the Veterans Hospital and the Parkland Tarma Hospital uh, for this. And the first thing we did is developed clean rooms, five times less polluted by particulate analysis, five times less polluted by um, gas chromatography and, and uh, the different uh, modalities of that, so that the patients uh, uh, could unmask, you see? And then you could prove cause and effect by stimulation. And that's uh, uh, the principle we've gone on. So what we use is organic cotton, non-herbicided, non-pesticided cotton, uh, metal, metal bed frames that were no outgassing at all by any measurement, ceramic tile put down with non-toxic grout. One of the big things now is toxic grout that you put down and, and you can ruin the room or to toxic hardwood flooring rather than nailing it. And then uh, walls that were made out of plaster. Um, and hardwood as the uh, chairs uh, are going on here. We didn't know about TVs at that time and uh, certainly don't have that in our rooms anymore. Uh, and we'll have a screen. And we've learned a lot since then, but as you can see, these are rather clean rooms. We uh, use a lot of glass uh, that were also no outgassing. And uh, the uh, people in there use uh, organic cotton or silk or linen natural fibers that didn't outgas and therefore uh, no perfumes and, and uh, things like that uh, so that you could decrease that total load. And, and then we used uh, uh, porcelain. The only thing I could think of uh, was glass and porcelain from the old European type things. And what we found out was the, the walls that were porcelain, the blue area there, uh, if you fired sand at 1,200 degrees, uh, you still got outgassing. If you fired it at 2,000 degrees, you had almost little or no outgassing. So therefore, uh, that technology really made a big difference in a lot of people, you see. And this happens to be one of our uh, skin testing rooms uh, is showing the cleanliness uh, of the area. Now, Professor Fenevis, uh, Professor of Physics at the University of Texas, um, and Robert Edgar, who got his PhD in this, did air analysis on um, both pollution indoors and outdoors, so we would have a comparison of cause and effect. And uh, they evaluated about 500 buildings. And um, now Matrix Laboratory has this uh, set up so you can actually do it in the home. And they have portable kits that are sent all over the world where you can uh, an analyze the air and uh, prove how toxic it is. You know, formaldehyde is a big one along with the pesticides and uh, the uh, phenols and ethanols and so on down the line. And it gives us a good picture then of the patient's house along with pictures. Uh, Lindsay Wing, uh, oh, the other thing is that we found are implants. There are now 220 implants that uh, can be put in a human. And I've been guilty of many of those, of course. Uh, because uh, we in uh, surgery uh, use those. Now we find that the metal plates, and I'd be interested in your opinion on those, Dr. Carpenter, would be that uh, uh, they act as aerials. And uh, some of them, uh, uh, when you have lightning storms or where they, they get around uh, fixtures, they have trouble. And of course the synthetics 
uh, the poly, polyurethanes, polyvinyls, polyesters, and so on, also can screw it up. I have a patient who had a, a pacemaker, uh, and uh, she immediately, when the pacemaker was put in, got electrically sensitive. And we neutralized her and treated her. And uh, after uh, she did well, and for two years, and then her pacemaker failed. And of course, she had a new one, same thing happened. We neutralized that and gave her good nutrition. She'd been seven years now without, uh, with her pacemaker doing very well. And this just happened to be an example of what you see. The orthopedic guys are uh, big uh, proponents of this because uh, of some of the studies. Now, the other thing that uh, we used was John Lasseter, Department of Biochemistry at the University of New Orleans. And uh, he did blood, air, and uh, uh, chemical analysis on about uh, 20,000 patients, of which we could get pesticide levels, solvents, and uh, uh, both organophosphates and organochlorines, and uh, showed cause and effect. And uh, so we've done many patients in that. And it's a great tool, diagnostic in mind, because then you can treat, prove cause and effect. Um, the, only, the other thing, of course, is uh, uh, Dr. Hardnell uh, said is a psychological bromide that they always use uh, to say these people are crazy. And uh, I, Professor Butler at the University of North Texas and Dr. Didrikson developed a pro psychological profile that showed cause and effect. And we use this on every court case there is, and it's held up almost 100% of the time. Nobody's been able to shoot holes uh, in this. And so we've done about 2,000 of these tests. Then the, the, the cause and effect that I uh, liked was Simon and Hickey. I said, you gotta show something, show a picture. I'm a surgeon, I don't know anything. I've gotta have pictures of these things. So can't you guys develop a, uh, a picture of uh, chemical, chemical problems? And I'm seeing now electromagnetics. And so uh, Dr. Simon and Hickey have done about uh, 700 of these uh, triple camera <laughs> scans. And this is uh, normal. Uh, and as you can see, the different uh, camera angles and the, the nice thing and the interesting thing about it, you see how everything's outlined very well and smooth on a so-called normal head? Well, let's look at a chemically sensitive patient. First, it's hazy, it's fuzzy. If you look at all the edges, they're, they're fuzzy around. If you look at the middle slide, there are dang holes in the head. And, and when they always tell my patients, uh, you got whole, you got the psychological problems all in your head. I say, you bet it is. And I can show, got the proof that I can show you that you got holes in your head. The other thing is that most of these people have short-term memory losses. And if you look at the uh, um, uh, temporal lobes way down low on the low film, you can see how they're real fuzzy and they don't have an outline like the previous uh, scan here. And you see how sharp those are down there and then how, how uh, fuzzy and out, not outlined. So, you know, you can prove cause and effect this way also. And so I think this technology uh, should uh, be spread throughout the world and we ought to be able to use it. Now, the other thing is, is that, uh, uh, which to me is finally encouraging only after 30 years of work, uh, the uh, circulation, the American Heart Journal has an article on how Atrial fibrillation most likely is not a, just a defect in the heart, that maybe something is triggering the atrial fibrillation. Well, how many sudden deaths do we see? How many patients do we have that suddenly die? How do we know that this is not electrical sensitivity and chemical sensitivity that's been primed for years with the sudden, uh, sudden illness of quote unquote death? So anyway, these are the things. We've done about 1,500 cases of measuring heart rate variability on these patients, and they've done, uh, proved out pretty well. Also, Professor Ishikawa, Kitasato University Medical School in uh, Japan and the head of ophthalmology there, uh, did studies uh, with, he developed another one where you can measure the autonomics through the eyes, and he did uh, about uh, 1,500 
of these in uh, our center with his students over six years. So that could prove cause and effect. Then of course, the big thing in treatment, one of the things is nutrition, oral nutrition and intravenous nutrition. Then finally, we found a subset of patients now who have uh, low gamma globulin subsets like IgG 1, 2, 3, and 4. And, and we're finding that about 30% of our patients have the subsets, which be, can, can now be corrected. And you can do this uh, by intermuscularly, one shot a week for a month. But you have to have the other caveat, find the triggering agents, find the cause. That's the name of the game. And uh, the other thing that we found is Bertie Griffiths from our center found that uh, mold sensitivity was a big triggering agent for these, and particularly mycotoxins. And then Dennis Hooper uh, developed uh, a urine mycotoxins that you can use now for trichosethenes and some of the other mycotoxins. And this has proved a big, big, uh, big advantage for our patients because we can say, hey, you're, either your work or your house is contaminated with molds, better clean it up, and we better prove cause and effect on this, which we can do now. Now, Jean Monroe and uh, Cyril Smith, Jean at the Breakspear Hospital in England, and she's somebody you ought to have here, uh, 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 described the electrical sensitivity and the chemical problem. 80% of the people uh, with uh, chemical sensitivity in our experience uh, had uh, this pre-electrical pre sensitivity. So it's not, doesn't occur by magic. There's usually a, a prime for that. And uh, so that we've used a lot. So you can, my, my thing is you ought to do challenge tests of some kind. I'll show you later a booth where we do the uh, inhaled challenges at the doses in the parts per billion and it's a room within a room, environmentally controlled, so you can really get the measurements of those. And uh, so you can do it with inhaled tests. Also, you can do it intradermally. And uh, with the, with the uh, EMF, we found that people got to wear uh, rubber so or leather-soled shoes, and uh, that uh, they, they can be shielded a lot of times by uh, copper, aluminum, silver. There are suits out now that uh, uh, people wear. I just had a physician come in from Bermuda who couldn't walk into our clinic. She was so electrically sensitive. We've got her on one of these shielded suits with aluminum and silver and organic cotton. And uh, she uh, uh, cleared and we could neutralize her and get her nutrition going. She's back in Bermuda, which apparently is quite crowded with electrical and chemical problems, and has done extremely well. Practiced good and, and, uh, and uh, functioned extremely well. So those are some of the things that you can do with that. Now, uh, environmental units around the world are still sparse, and I'm hoping that uh, every country will have several. And, and that's, uh, these are some of them, uh, Roy Fox in uh, Canada, and Al Robbins in Florida, Jane, Jean Monroe at the Breakspear, and then Klaus Runo, student of mine, apparently has one in Amstel that he's worked. Uh, Pilar Munoz has uh, one in Spain, Colin Little in uh, Melbourne, Hong Yu Zhang in uh, Peking, and uh, Ishikawa in Tokyo. Now, there are several societies that have uh, sprung up on this, and I know you Europeans have started uh, development, and I'm so glad about that. Uh, American ones are the uh, uh, American Academy of Environmental Medicine, Pan American Allergy Society, Australian ENT Society, and uh, there are now hundreds of physicians, thousands, that are doing some aspects of this, and we're quite encouraged. This is a, a room within a room that's environmentally controlled, and uh, you can put the substance in there, either a blank or a substance, and prove cause and effect on these people at very low doses. Now, the, the knowledge of hypersensitivity, uh, David was alluded to that, and so was uh, uh, Professor Hardinaugh, was that uh, you, uh, 
don't know why it occurs, but there's many recent articles now that show that if you've got a damage uh, in your cell membrane, the potassium leaks out, which we've all known, but the calcium goes in. 59 calciums outside, one part in the cell. And uh, what that does is combined with protein kinase A and C, and it's phosphorylated, and it'll increase hypersensitivity a thousand times. And that's probably why a lot of people don't lose this hypersensitivity, but on the other hand, also why a lot of people do. And so uh, you can get repair uh, with this. We use antigens that are preservative free only in saline, so you can prove cause and effect by every substance you do. Food sensitivity is a big one, and mold sensitivity is a big one once you damage this mechanism. And we like to prove provocation in a controlled environment uh, on these. And these are just some of the antigens. We've got big freezers uh, for that uh, reason. And uh, some of the antigens that have there. Now, uh, we, uh, if I've got time, uh, wanted to show what some of our patients have done and uh, we have done with uh, uh, little trailers where they can park in their backyard or park someplace and uh, be environmentally controlled. Also, uh, the Marriott chain, we have 20, 22 beds at the Environmental Health Center run by Marriott. And uh, then there are many houses. So these are the Airstream. I don't know whether you have these in Europe, but they're all aluminum trailers. Uh, and. Uh, this happens to be one. And uh, then these are some of our rooms that uh, we've uh, developed with that. And I've shown these, so I'll keep on with that. And these are some of the homes that have uh, been done. And I think some of them quite tastily uh, with uh, different organic materials and non-toxic uh, materials. Uh, we like uh, hard floors. If you're going to have rugs, I want them that can be washed and washed again and then washed again because you can't get the toxics out of them. And as you can see, different varieties of homes have been developed uh, with these people. So uh, this, I point this out in your uh, right-hand corner here. This aluminum wallpaper. And it is impervious to uh, most toxics. So if you've got a toxic wall, a lot of times you can put it on there. Uh, a lot of times I just use aluminum foil and put it on there. It's a lot cheaper, you know. But uh, people who want to do something tastely, at least you can get it uh, done. Now, for therapy, of course, we, we use first total body load reduction and then proving a cause and effect. And then uh, we would use uh, oxygen therapy. We learned, I learned this from cardiopulmonary bypass, but uh, our friend, uh, Professor Von Arden in Dresden, uh, developed oxygen therapy. And that's been a great boon. What we find is if you do a, a PaO2 on these people, normal across the lungs, okay, 95, 98%. But if you do it in the anacubital fossa without a tourniquet, where the patient uh, is, uh, got supposedly extracted oxygen from the blood to run on, you'll find it very high at times. And a matter of fact, we've seen people run on 25% oxygen. And you give them oxygen therapy, it's simple, two hours a day for uh, four to eight liters. And uh, they do extremely well. I've got the statistics to back these up, but I didn't have time uh, to show them. And then finally, the... Uh, Last thing is that we've had many patients now who have low T lymphocytes, and this seems to be one of the big problems in the chemically sensitive patient. And uh, on these uh, patients, uh, uh, Bertie Griffith Flower Center developed an extract of uh, where you grow uh, uh, the T lymphocytes of a patient into a uh, media, and it takes about six weeks. The weak ones die. They divide every generation for every 24 hours. The strong ones get stronger and multiply. And after that, you can have an injection uh, of this, and it really boosts uh, patients. You can do that every four days. So these are the kind of things that we've used uh, 
uh, uh, trying to follow the principles of chemical sensitivity and of treatment. So I'm going to stop now, and uh, I guess my time's up. So thank you very much.